Welcome to the Living Rock Podcast. I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. I was, uh, I was born into a family of non-believers uh, in North Wales in the mid-1970s. I know I don't look that old, but I am. And quite proudly, especially after the result yesterday, I'm proud to call myself Welsh. <laughs> Wait till it matters, gosh. I was expecting a bit more from the Welsh congregation, you know. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. My, um, my family was working class. My dad worked as a bricklayer, building houses. Uh, my mum looked after um, three children. And I would say that I had a good, children, a good childhood, but I never actually went to church at all other than for, and I can probably still remember a couple of them, four remembrance services. My whole childhood, four remembrance services. And that was it. Um, I didn't know God. Um, and in retrospect, I don't even know if I actually believed in his existence. But I was definitely sure of one thing, that there must be something or someone greater than just our existence on this earth. I actually remember probably having a bit of OCD as a child, and I remember I used to actually go to bed. This is confession time, folks, right? I actually remember going to bed, and virtually every night before I went to sleep, I'd pull the covers over myself, I would hold my breath for 10 seconds, and I would stay still, hoping that any evil spirits would disappear. I actually did that as a child. And I actually remember doing it when I, actually, when I moved to university. So I remember doing it as an adult. Um, something within me made me think that there was something greater than just beyond it. And, and whether that be good or whether that not be good, I knew of something. It was in the beginning of my fourth year in university that I was asked by some friends in my year if I wanted to go to church. Um, I had no interest whatsoever going to their church. I thought it would have cold seats, damp walls, uh, boredom, all of those things, because that's what I had, those are the four experiences I had had during my childhood. So I said, no, go away, not interested. And despite my polite declining of offers, they carefully persisted. And I can't remember how many times it is now, but it must have been at least five times that I eventually said, yes, okay, I'll come. In the back of my mind, I knew the only reason I was going was because I had some really important exams at the beginning of my fourth year, and I'd take whatever luck I could get. I'd take my chances. So I said, why not? And uh, why not has often been a really great response uh, to myself over the years. Asking why is often a question that actually creates a barrier for us when we're trying to make a decision. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't make balanced decisions. I'm saying that for me, I mostly ask the question why when I'm actually seeking an excuse. That's another confession. So why go to church? Well, why not? So I went. Um, that was a church very similar to this one. If you've been to the church that we, we are affiliated with in Cardiff, you would know that. Um, and I went to church. It was a vibrant atmosphere full of happy, smiling people. Um, uh, it was warm, not damp. It had warm seats, comfortable seats, soft seats, not heavy pews, hard pews, as I, I remember. And there were so many people of different ages and so many people of, uh, of my age. And something really intrigued me. So I did my exams and I thankfully passed them. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, and then I was asked again if I wanted to go to church. And my immediate response was, why not? Something was stirring on the inside of me and I didn't know what it was but it gets a little bit selfish here. That I'm just giving you a little bit of a warning. I was a scientist, still am a scientist, and I needed evidence. I needed proof, and I was seeking to find that proof 
and investigate it and prove it. So I went to church thinking that somebody was going to take me to one side, I actually believed this, and show me the secret of what it was all about. I'd been at least twice, so I wondered if I was now eligible to be taken into a special room (laughs) and given the password that would suddenly unlock all of the secrets of the other side and how amazing that would be for me. I had my future planned out. I had a career planned out. I knew the first flash car I was going to buy when I graduated. And I I was actually arrogant enough to think that knowing the secrets of the other side would make me even more special. (laughs) Well, it didn't quite work out according to my plan. There was no secret room. There were no eligibility criteria, such as go to church at least twice and all will be revealed. That's a great motto. We should think about that. (laughs) I remember during the singing, one Sunday morning, this is probably the third time I had gone, maybe the fourth time I'd gone after being invited. And I remember sitting in the second row, or standing in the second row during the worship, um, on probably just about where David is sitting, and just feeling an urge to sit down. This huge weight just came upon me, and I had to sit down. And I sat down and I closed my eyes and I put my head in my hands and I had an encounter with God. And I won't go into the details, but needless to say, it was so real that I could never, ever doubt his existence. And I know you're all thinking, wow, I'd love to hear that story. And I'm happy to tell you that story, but not quite now. Um, It was a real, tangible experience so that nobody could try to convince me God didn't exist because I knew he existed, full stop. Um, The singing finished, the preacher spoke, and at the end of the the service, a very old man, now I'm not saying he was in the Methuselah territory of 969, but he was very old, a very, very, um, very old man. He looked about 969. And uh, he came up to me and he, after the meeting, as soon as the meeting finished, and he said, what happened to you? I don't know how he knew something might have happened to me, but he clearly felt he should come up to me and say, what happened? And I told him a little bit, and at that particular point, he led me in a prayer to becoming a Christian. Immediate. Um, I was a little overwhelmed when another man, not so old, came bustling along, And he told me the story of um, a Bible story, which I obviously wasn't familiar with at that time, of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And he said, we're baptizing people this morning. You should get baptized. You've given your life to Jesus. Now you should be baptized. So I did. No hesitation. I, I just believed everything. You could, I just believed. I believed that God was real. I knew he was real. If I've got to be baptized, that's what the Bible says, I'll do it. No, no hesitation. And so in February 1998, this was, um, in a church building in Cardiff, I gave my life to Jesus and my life was completely changed forever. Amen. A radical transformation. Amen. Amen. Why do I tell you this story uh, to open up my encouragement to you? Well, why not? It's about having friends of faith. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, friends of faith. And amazingly, we've already heard some of the things that I want to talk to you about. So Rachel came up earlier and she spoke about homeless people. Now, we might know them as homeless people, but Rachel calls them friends. They're friends. Whenever she talks about them, she calls them friends. She is a friend of faith to the homeless community that she is seeking to see saved and added to the church or a church and also radically transformed in their their walk forward with God. So for me, I had friends of faith who invited me to church and politely persisted even when I said no. I had friends of faith who responded to what God had told them and led me to finding Christ And I had friends of faith who showed me the next steps in the Bible. 
leading me to becoming, I'm being baptised. What if those faithful friends had not invited me to church? What if they had not persisted in their friendship with me? What if they had given up on the idea of me becoming a Christian? Would I be standing here? I don't know, and I don't even want to think about it. But interestingly, the person who prayed with me directly after the, this meeting in Cardiff um, and the person who told me about baptism were complete and utter strangers to me. I'd never, ever spoken to them before. Yet they were friends of faith and they stepped out of their comfort zone to speak to me and to lead me to Christ. And I don't know if you've ever had that feeling where you know you should do something, but you're not quite sure you feel you want to do it. I'm sure it was the same for them. You know, they obviously saw something or heard something in the spirit and actually responded to it. Luke chapter 5, if you want to turn to it, I love this story. And it tells, some, it tells a story and gives an account of some other friends of faith. So Luke chapter 5, it will be a familiar story to you, but I just want to draw a couple of things out of it. So Luke chapter 5, verse 17. One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and experts in the law were sitting near him. They had come out of every village in Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. God's power to heal people was with him. Soon, some men arrived carrying a paralytic, and they kept trying to carry him in, to put him down in front of Jesus. When they failed to find a way of getting him in, because of a dense crowd, they went up onto the top of the house and let him down, bed and all, through the tiles, into the middle of the crowd, in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, My friend, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and the Pharisees began to argue about this, saying, Who is this man who talks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins? Only God can do that. Jesus realised what was going on in their minds and spoke straight to them. Why must you argue like this in your minds? Which do you suppose is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? But to make you realise that the Son of Man has full authority on earth to forgive sins, I tell you, he said to the man who was paralysed, get up, pick up your bed and go home. Instantly, the man sprang to his feet before their eyes, picked up the bedding on which he used to lie and went off home praising God. Sheer amazement gripped every man present and they praised God and said in awed voices, we have seen incredible things today. What a wonderful story. Absolutely wonderful. And this account is not just about friends, but friends of faith. Why did those men choose to carry the paralysed men to the house where Jesus was? Why not? Why did they persist, even though there was a dense crowd? Why not? What if they gave up after the first obstacle, they must have believed in the ability and the power of Jesus to heal, and not just for themselves, but for another person, they stepped out. The Bible tells us that when they failed, they found a different way through together. And the same account in Mark 2 uses a word meaning they dug through the roof. They literally dug through the roof in order to create a hole to lower this paralysed man in his bed through. And I really believe that they, they had to dig deep in order to see a breakthrough. They had to dig deep to break through and see the realisation of what they believed come to pass. The healing of the paralysed man was his breakthrough. They were unwavering. Think of it in the context of friends of faith. They were unwavering. 
They were uncompromising, they were undistracted, they were focused, and they were convinced that Jesus could heal the paralyzed man. Now, Jesus doesn't comment on the faith of the paralyzed man at all, but their faith, those who brought him. And we all need friends of faith. Friends who will do us good, correct us when, we're, when our thinking is out of line, and comfort and care us when we need it. Now, I, I'm a real supporter of the body speaking, and so I've asked two people to come and speak just a small testimony about how friends have helped them in their walk with God. So, Marion, Marion Sinclair. I felt like I was doing a school register for a moment then. <laughs> Greg Montgomery. You're supposed to stay here. <laughs> now, you're going to need the microphone. Yeah, okay. I had a photo shoot for work on Saturday and... Um... You need a mic. In heels. I was running in my high heels and I hit my ankle, hence <laughs> the dog matter. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marion Sinclair. Um, four years ago, um, when I lost my husband, I was quite devastated. And, um, Hold the mic up. But I was so blessed with uh, such amazing friends and also I was so blessed with my um, sister and my nieces, my family, uh, praying family. So I was so, so privileged that they were able to pray with me and stand with me because there were times when I couldn't pray. Because straight after, um, I mean, after I lost my husband, I also inherited like... Um, staff who were working for the company because we were running a company as well so I was running that and then I had the staff to look after so everything just felt so overwhelming it was I, yeah I, I've been a manager my background is a chef uh, I've, uh, I've trained as a counsellor but I've never run a company before so I was just so so overwhelmed and not long after that COVID hit as well so it was like Wow, some, some of you actually know my story because there, there were some of the staff that, you know, they were not happy and wanted to go. And yeah, so I let them go. I just pray that they find a good place to go. And they went. And um, some of my friends in church were just amazing. They just stood with me, they prayed with me, no judgment. I can say whatever I felt. Because the reality is that sometimes when tragedy hits, there are no words. You know, and you feel you want to be spiritual all the time, as I call it. But even though I've been a believer for like 40 years, don't ask my age. It was like, <laughs> it was like, Lord, you know, this is just overwhelming. I just can't do this. I just can't do this. And like David, I thought, okay, I'll just share how I felt with God. And I shared, and I said, Lord, I just can't do it. I just need you. I just, there are no words. I can't pray. I can't do anything. But I was so, so grateful that friends and my family, they were just, just so faithful and stood with me and prayed with me when I couldn't pray. And I always, always Actually, I always, always sense the presence of God. Even in the midst of it all. I always, always sense the presence of God. And I knew that God was with me. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that, no, okay, I'm feeling this way yet. The circumstance hasn't changed. However, the knowing that God says, I'll be with you, that definitely sustained me through and through. And... Prior to that, uh, just before uh, my husband went to, to be with Jesus, it was like the word of God says, and the peace of God that surpass all understanding shall guard, shall guard your heart and your mind. And that really sustained me, knowing that the peace of God is really going to sustain me. If God has said it, then it's true. No matter how I feel, not, dis, not, not disregarding how you feel, but at the same time, what does the word of God say? God's word is final. And if, if he says, I'm going to be with you, then he is going to be with us, period. 
no matter what, no matter what the circumstance is, even if the circumstance does not change, his word says, I will be with you and I will give you peace. And that gave me such strength to just keep going and just keep uh, pressing in, as I call it, and keep persevering. And I'm just so grateful to God that I stayed the course because it was not easy, but I'm so, so grateful. I'm not going to go for Jesus. Where am I going to go? Behind me, there is nothing. In front of me, there is nothing but Jesus. Only Jesus. He's the only one. And faithful friends and being in the house of God, finding somewhere to fellowship. That's what sustained me. So, yeah. So, thank you for listening. It's, um, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that Marion says, um, even when I couldn't pray, and, you know, I hope and I pray I'm never put into that position of tragedy or circumstance where I cannot pray. And it must have been very similar for the, for the man who, the paralyzed man who, who couldn't do something he would have wanted to do. He couldn't walk to that house. He couldn't press through to be into the presence of Jesus, to be healed. And yet being around other people, supporting you, coming together, suddenly you find Jesus again and you find your peace. How wonderful is that? Greg, who is wearing a Welsh top? Yeah, if I'm a little bit croaky this morning, you'll kind of understand why. Um, just want to use a testimony to illustrate what Richard's asked, to, asked me to talk about, which is when friends of faith come around us. Um, and I would split those responses of those friends into practical responses and spiritual responses, but they're not mutually exclusive. They, they come, one comes from the other. Um, quick summary, I'm not going to take you back 10 years, but uh, the business that I'd set up and was running was successful with uh, two other Christian brothers um, in the renewable sector. We had to close that down because it was no longer viable because of changing government policy. And so that left me without a job, effectively. Um, we, we left everything clean, everything got paid off, and we did everything with integrity. That was our, our first intention. But it left me without a source of income, or so I thought, anyway. And... Um, and so for two, just over two years, I didn't have formal employment, a job. Uh, and for just over two years, um, I, I knew how much it cost to run our household, just to pay the bills. Um, and the money coming in from odd jobs that I could do, temporary work as a project manager, doing odd jobs for people around houses, sometimes paid, sometimes not paid, um, met about a third of our bills. That's where we're at. So we're about two-thirds short of the money needed to pay our bills. Um, and Sunday mornings would come and midweeks would come and I, I'd feel sort of a hand going in my back pocket thinking, that's a bit, bit odd to church. But somebody stuffing, you know, 300 pounds in my back pocket to bless us practically. Um, I remember doing some uh, odd jobs for a lady and her two sons. Uh, some stuff, the house is starting to call a, sort of get into disrepair. So I fixed some light switches, put up some curtains, put the handrail back on the stairs, that kind of, just lots of odd things. And in the background, this lady was, was cooking lots and lots of really nice food. And, you know, during the course of two days, my mouth was watering. Um, and after those two days, she plated it all up and said, this is for you. I thought it was for her and the two sons. But there was enough food for us, for Kay and I and our two girls, for you know, the best part of three or four days. Practical blessing. But those blessings, whether they were financial or whether they were food on a plate or whatever it might be, um, we had a friend who said, I want to pay your mortgage for the next six months. I want to pay your car costs for the next six months. I mean, that's big ticket items, isn't it? A big ticket blessing, I call that. Um, they did that through faith because what they said to me is that we believe in sowing those things into you by blessing you and meeting your need. We're sowing into good soil. So they weren't, I say just, don't, don't get that wrong, but they weren't just doing it because they saw a need. They were doing it because they had faith that they were sowing into a family that they believed, and we believe, are good soil. Um, 
I had friends who stood with us um, when I was in very dark places. Um, first and foremost is my best friend, Kay, my wife. You'd be pleased to hear I married my friend. <laughs> um, times when I needed a strong word, a strongly worded strong word. You know, when I needed to have a chat with myself. And if I wasn't prepared to have a chat myself, have a chat with somebody who will do that for you. But we had other friends who held our rope. Roger Aubrey brought a word to us in Cardiff where he said, we need to hold each other's rope. And I, I had friends who practically and spiritually said, I'm going to stand with you and I'm going to hold your rope. I'm not going to let you fall. And I, we had friends like Nick and Emma Barton, Mark and Colette Smethers. Some of you might know these, you might not. Richard and Annie, uh, amongst many others who stood with us practically and said, we want to hold your rope. We want to pray for you. And in those times when I was in danger of spiraling, they said, no, this isn't God's word. God's word for you is that you will be blessed and you will be blessed abundantly. God's word over you is that you will have peace. Thank you, Marianne, for speaking that because that's exactly what people said. When I felt turmoil, when I was in my lowest place, really, really low, they said, you will have that peace that you, you just don't understand. I felt sad, so sad at times. I genuinely felt at times I was depressed or I was struggling with anxiety. And Tim brought a word this morning to say that the joy of the Lord isn't dependent on how we feel. And this is what people were saying to me, is that God wants you to have joy in your heart. That's nothing to do with your feelings or your circumstances. It's because of what his plan is for us uh, and our life. Um, friends, whether they bring words, whether they bring scripture, whether they bring encouragement, whether they bring practical blessing, they did it out of faith. And faith that they would see us come through those circumstances. And when I wavered, when I had doubts, when we wavered and had, well I know I did, had doubts and struggled in my faith, they came alongside, and a bit like Moses in Exodus 17, when he was uh, calling on the Lord and his, his arms started to droop, people came alongside him and held his arms up. When his arms were drooping, the army was losing. When his arms were held up, the army was winning. And this is what our friends of faith did with us. They came alongside us and practically and spiritually held up our arms so that the army was winning. Amen. Wonderful, thank you. I don't need to say any more. Um, I just want to try and make it a little bit practical, just for five minutes, if that's possible. I have three questions, only two of which are going to appear on the screen behind me, because the third one hasn't turned up. Um, the first question is this, and I just want you to get into groups of two or three, and what I'm going to do after is to ask you to just shout out some answers, okay? So just for five minutes, nothing more, um, I'm going to keep my eye on the clock. First question, what do we think are the characteristics of friends of faith? In other words, how could you recognize one? Number two, how can we personally be more involved and supportive in our, to our spiritual family here in Living Rock Church. And thirdly, which is not on there, how can we be friends of faith to people we know but whom are not yet believers? Okay, what are the characteristics of friend of faith? How can we be more involved and supportive here? And how can we be friends of faith to people we know but who are not yet believers? Five minutes, starting now. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure that could actually be a conversation that could carry on, and that's fantastic, and maybe it should. Um, let's just go through the first... Well, let's go through all of the questions, but just, just some quick shout-outs, really. Um, what are the characteristics of friends of faith? Anybody? Persistence. Persistence. Care. Care. Integrity. Integrity. Like it. Loving. Loving. Reliable. Encouraging. 
Encouraging, yes, absolutely. Non judgmental. Generous. Great, great words, aren't they? Great adjectives to describe what we should be, who we are. I've, I've written down a couple of others, which you've, inclu- which you've already said some of them. Loyal, trustworthy, caring, understanding. What about number two? How can we personally be more involved and supportive to our spiritual family? It's serving in the church, excellent. Showing love, show, showing unconditional love to each other. Bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. Being part of a small group. Looking out for people that haven't got anybody talking to them. Looking out for people who haven't got anybody looking out for them or talking to them. Really important, especially for newcomers. Pray. Pray. Pray for each other. That's really important. Really, really important. Anybody else? Involve yourself in other people's lives. Knock on the door, three in the morning. No, I'm joking. <laughs> really, really important. But, but, and I think, I think actually it's something I hadn't thought of until you said it, is consistency. Really, really important. Consistency is massive. I've written down life groups. Yes, and we talked about it briefly this morning in terms of relaunch. Um, prayer groups, text messages, WhatsApp messages, sharing scriptures with each other, being an encourager, having accountability with one another, um, and correction. Ooh, there's a word we don't often like, but... If you see a brother or a sister doing something wrong, you tell them. (laughs) Really important. We need accountability in our lives. And number three, which I realise isn't up there, but um, how can we be friends of faith to people we know but who are not yet believers? Be encouraging, yeah. Respect them, yeah. Kind acts. Kind acts. We're into love languages now, which is lovely. Non judgmental. Ask if you can pray for them. Be bold, yeah, really good. Be faithful friends to them, yeah, very, very important. Share the gospel with them. Share the gospel with them. Invite them to church. Church events. Church events. There might, there might be a little bit resistance to church. Oh, please, please let's not use the word event. I hate the word event. <laughs> church. Let's invite them to church. Um, <clears throat> exactly like Rachel was. Rachel was a friend, a friend to people. Um, I've, got, I've got a friend who said to me, I'll believe in Jesus if you, if you prove it to me. And I said, well, you're looking at him. And everybody goes, What? And I go, I'm a witness of Christ. Christ lives in me. You judge me by my actions. That's what fruit is all about. You know, Christ lives in me. So there are many more examples of friends of faith in the Bible. I'm not going to go into them now, but um, it does, the Bible does say so many things about friends. And I'm just going to read some scriptures and ask you to think about some of these in the context of you as an individual and us as a body. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says this, so encourage each other, there's that word again, and build each other up just as you are already doing. And I love what the message translation says about this scripture. It says, build up hope so you'll all be together in this, no one left out and no one left behind. What a beautiful picture. A beautiful picture that we're if we're on a, a walk together, that people are at the back pushing, <laughs> like the paralyzed man, they're helping. They're helping those who may not as be, be as quick as those up front, but no one is left behind. Proverbs 18, 24 says, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. 
Romans 12 says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. John 15 says, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And one of my personal favorites, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 to 12 says, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. Really important. We all want each other to succeed, don't we? Yes. Yes, we do. Two people are better than, off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And I just want to read Galatians 6 from, from the Message Bible, which says, So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. How amazing is that? I always read scripture slowly because every word counts. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. So my words to you today are hopefully provoking, and I've created a bit of a checklist for us all to think about. It's rhetorical, and I just want to remind you before I say these things, I want to remind us of Romans 8, verse 1, which says, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. I am not judging anybody, okay? I just want you to, maybe if we all just close our eyes, it's a checklist, but I just want us to engage, because I think that hopefully God is going to do something spiritually within us. So just some questions. How do I line up with some of the characteristics of friends of faith? Am I doing all that I can do to be a good friend of faith to my church family? Am I serving? Am I faithful with what God has entrusted to me, my talents and my abilities? Am I reaching my full potential? Am I a tither? Am I a sower? Am I generous on every occasion? Am I living up to God's expectations of me? Am I attending a life group? Is my talk wholesome? Do I gossip? Do I swear? Am I drinking too much alcohol? Am I looking after my body? Am I spending time doing things which are not good for me? Do I need to forgive somebody who has hurt me? Do I need to speak to a friend of faith and say, help? Do I see any of my church family in need and do nothing about it? Do I need to get alongside somebody? Am I being a friend of faith to those who do not yet know Jesus? Am I honest about my faith in front of others? Do I lead a life which would witness Christ to others? 
do I offer to pray with non-Christians? Do I, strug- do I make myself available to neighbours and friends who may be struggling? Who are we being friends of faith to? You see, we all need, you can open your eyes now, we all need friends of faith. We all need each other. And I know some of those questions are challenging even for me. But I just feel that, and I'm not saying it's an exclusive checklist, but at least it helps me to think, am I doing all that I could do to fulfill everything that God wants for me whilst I am here on this earth? We all need friends of faith and we all need each other. That's it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Search for us online and get information about upcoming events and more great teaching.